The scripture reading this morning before the lesson comes from Acts chapter 10, verses 30 through 35. Acts 10, 30 through 35, and I'll be reading from the New King James Version. So Cornelius said, four days ago I was fasting until this hour, and at the ninth hour I prayed in my house, and behold, a man stood before me in bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your alms are remembered in the sight of God. Send therefore to Joppa, and call Simon here, whose surname is Peter. He is lodging in the house of Simon, a tanner, by the sea. When he comes, he will speak to you. So I sent to you immediately, and you have done well to come. Now therefore, we are, we are all present before God to hear all the things commanded you by God. We live in a world filled with hatred and violence. And it's been that way for quite some time. And unfortunately, the way things look, it may continue to stay that way for some time. But we can't let those things overtake us. Let me give you two examples. Dylan Roof. At the time, a 21-year-old admitted white supremacist murdered nine black people sitting in a church building on June 17, 2015. Now, why did he do that? What would be in the mind of an individual to take intentionally the lives of other living human beings? I suppose only he and God know his real motivation but I can tell you this murder is never the solution it always causes more problems a man by the name of Micah Johnson a 25 year old black veteran who served in Afghanistan murdered five white police officers this very month and year why why would he do that why would he carry on that I don't know. I suppose only he and God alone know the real motivation behind that. But I know murder is never the solution. It only causes more and more and more problems. You know, the teaching of Jesus Christ in Mark 12, 29 through 31 needs to be echoed throughout the ages. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest of all the commandments? Jesus answered him and said, the first of all the commandments is, Hear, O Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. There is none other commandment greater than these. That needs to be preached and re-preached and taught and retaught until time is no more. If mankind would simply understand and implement those powerful words, racism would be a thing of the past. We're talking about deplorable isms, and today we're going to talk about racism. You know, in studying for this, I, I didn't know this till I began to study it. Did you know it's racist to talk about racism? <laughs> I, now, again, if the Bible deals with racism then it's not racist. So some may think Brock's a racist because he's up there talking about racism. I'm not. I'm not. We're dealing with a Bible subject. It's a deplorable ism, and we're going to deal with it today. Four things we want to do. First, we're going to talk about the concept of racism. What is racism? And we're going to try to deal with that. And then second, we're going to talk about the creation of racism. What, in other words, what is the source of racism? I can tell you from the outset, be certain that it didn't come from God. This did not come from God at all. Third, we're going to talk about some concerns with racism. What is the purpose of racism? What is the real purpose behind racism? And then fourth, we're going to give the cure for racism. And friend, rest assured that the truth of the Bible stops racism dead in its tracks every single time. 
So that's what we intend to do today. Now let's begin. First, let's talk about the concept of racism. Racism defined is the belief that all members of a certain race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another race or racism. We're going to deal with some of those words just in a second. But MerriamWebsterDictionary.com gives the definition of racism for students. That is, it's putting it down where the chickens can get it, I suppose. As this, the belief that certain races of people are by birth and nature superior to others. It is discrimination or hatred based on race. Now you won't find the word racist or racism in the Bible because it doesn't seem that this word even came into being before the 1930s. Now let me point out something very clearly from the outset. You do understand that the word racism is a misnomer. Now what you say, what's a misnomer? It's a wrong description. It is a wrong name. Do you do understand that racism is founded on the fact that there are different races of human beings? That's not true. There's only one race of human beings. There is humanity, period. So racism is a, first off, wrong description. It is a man-made word to describe other problems. Now, it is a false and wrong assumption to assume that there are various races of humanity. That's wrong. That's wrong. You may be able to say correctly there are various ethnic groups, but if you're a human being, you're, you're part of the race of humanity, period. So there are no different races. But though ethnic groupism would probably be a better description, words like bigotry, and stereotype and prejudice and discrimination actually are better descriptive words to describe racism. So what is the concept of racism boiled down? It is simply hating people who don't look like you. Period. They may have, and generally speaking, a different skin pigment than what you have. And simply because this individual, male or female, has a different skin pigmentation than what you may have, you hate them simply because of that. Isn't that one of the dumbest things you've ever heard in your whole entire life? But now let's get into the meat of this lesson. Let's talk about the creation of racism. What is the source of racism? I want to suggest three things to you. Number one... Racism is based on stubbornness. Now, I have a simple question that deserves some thought. Where did all human beings come from? Now, there's only one race of humanity. Understand that. So, ultimately, where did all human beings, where did all humanity come from? You know, the Bible clearly answers that question. It's not left up to superstition or guess where all humanity came from, the Bible says in Genesis 1-1, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. So all of creation, where did all of creation come from? It came from God. Well, what about mankind? Genesis 1-27 answers that. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that Adam and Eve were the first two human beings on this planet. So where did we all come from ultimately? Ultimately, all of us go back to those same two human beings in the Garden of Eden. Ultimately, now what color were they? Who cares? Who cares? Now, when you understand what happened with the worldwide flood and Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their four wives were on that ark, there's eight souls who were saved, as 1 Peter 3 says, by water. So ultimately, we all go back to Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. 
But then are you aware, of, that's in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, but are you aware of what happens in Genesis 11? At the tower of so-called of Babel, or Babel as it's called, where God confounded the languages of humanity and dispersed men out from that place. That is probably where the distinctions, the clear distinctions in skin pigments were made, was probably at the Tower of Babel. But go back before that. We go back to Noah and the ark. Well, where'd they come from? Adam and Eve. Ultimately, all of us came from Adam and Eve. Are you a human being? Then that's where we all came from. From the two supernaturally created human beings in the Garden of Eden on the sixth day of creation. Now, you may not like that, but that's the truth. Now, when we get stubborn and begin to think that because this person looks this way or this person doesn't look that way, that we're better than them, you've forgotten what the Bible teaches. This did not come from God. God had us all come from ultimately Adam and Eve. Now, I have a question for you, too. What color is the human spirit? Because all men, mankind, we're a triune, that is a threefold being. You're a body, that's all we can see. But you're also soul and you're also spirit. The Bible in Zechariah 12, 1 says that God is the father of spirits. And it's repeated in Hebrews 12 and verse 9. What color is the spirit? It's immaterial. It's, from our perspective, colorless. Now, who is the father of spirits? God, the God of the Bible, is the father of every spirit. That is, of every person. Now, incidentally, when you begin to start doing that, what color is God? Huh? What color is God? It's irrelevant. He's colorless. Because God is not material. Body is the material aspect of us, and we have based all of everything many times right and wrong on what we see. And what we see many times is not the real substance of a human being. There's something else to us made in God's image. You know the Bible teaches also in Acts 17, 26 and Acts 17, 29. God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth. Verse 29 for as much then as we are the offspring of God. Is a white man part of the offspring of God? Yes. Is a black man part of the offspring of God? Yes. What about a female? Yes. What about a child? Yes, absolutely. So this comes really from stubbornness and refusing to accept the evidence that is presented in God's holy word. But I want to give you another thing to think about too. What's the source of racism? Self-centeredness. Me, me, me. I, I, I. Stepping outside of what the Bible teaches. Let me give you some good advice. When we begin to lump or to combine all people into the same category, it's very unwise. You need to be very careful, just as I need to be very careful. When you say all, you fill in the blank, people are always, you fill in the blank. It's probably not true. You know, let me give you an illustration. I would like to be able to stand up here and say this. All members of the church of Christ are always faithful. I would really like to stand up here and say that and believe that, but that ain't true. Do you understand that? So if you want to start dividing things up by ethnic groups, if you say all of these people, whatever you want to say, are always this, I'm telling you, you're probably wrong. You're wrong, be it good or be it bad. You're probably wrong, so be very, 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 very careful when using the words all, always, none, and never because you're not God. And you don't know everything that God knows. Now let me prove this to you. Turn me to the book of Titus. Let me give you an example of this. In the book of Titus. Titus chapter 1. And I want you to consider what was said right here. And let's try to make some understanding behind this. Titus chapter 1. And let's look at verse number 12 beginning. Titus 1 and verse number 12. 
The inspired apostle Paul says, one of themselves, even a prophet of their own, said, the Cretans or the Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Now, what did one of their own prophets say? Will you see that word that he used there? Always. Always e or liars, evil beasts, slow bellies. Paul says this witness is true. Now, does that mean he's agreeing with that statement? The answer is no, it's not. It means not that the statement is true, but that it is true that it was said. Meaning the Apostle Paul saying, I'm affirming confidently, this is what they have said. It doesn't mean it's true, and I'll prove that it's not true, and that Paul didn't agree with it as we read on. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply. That means you need to stand up and say something against this, Titus. Wherefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables and commandments of men that turn from the truth. Now, when you go back and look at Acts chapter 2 and verse 11, there were people from this island. Crete is an island, incidentally. There were people in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. The implication is, more than likely, some of those people obeyed the gospel that day. But then, how do I know that what is said in verse 12, that the Cretans are always liars? Evil beasts, slow bellies. Do you not realize what Titus was left there on the island to do? Go back and look at verse 5. Look at it. For this cause left I thee in Crete, that's an island in the Mediterranean Sea, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders. Can an elder be a liar? No. Can an elder be an evil beast? No. Can an elder be a slow belly? No. So to say that all the Cretans were liars, evil beasts, and slow bellies, that's wrong. That's just wrong. So what did I tell you? You need to be careful about lumping or combining all of any people into one group, be it all positive or be it all negative. Stupid comes in all colors. Just as smart does. Do you understand that? Faithfulness comes in all colors. But so does unfaithfulness. Think about it, friend. Now, let me give you the third aspect behind this, behind the creation of racism, stubbornness, self-centeredness, but ultimately, it's Satan. Satan is the one who is the self-appointed adversary of everything that is right. It is he who is the cause of, of all this foolishness that goes on, whatever the foolishness may be, it's ultimately because of him. The Bible says in James 1.17 that every good and every perfect gift cometh from above, is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. So any good and perfect thing in anyone's life has ultimately come from above from God. But are you aware what the Bible teaches in 1 Peter 5.8? Be sober be vigilant because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now, do you realize that if the devil has us divided, it's a whole lot easier to whip us? Ultimately, the devil has put division of any and every sort amongst humanity so that it keeps us from heaven. That is his self-appointed goal. He'll do anything within his power to keep humanity at odds with one another. Because if we're fighting against each other, we're not fighting against the devil. There's the problem. Satan is ultimately our adversary. You aware what the Bible says in 1 John 2, 15 through 17? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world... The lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. And the world passeth away and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God. Question, is it the will of God that we practice the wrong term of racism? Is that God's will? What does the Bible say? But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Friend, 
hating people due to their skin color is just as foolish as believing a lie. Why would we do that? Are you aware of what the Bible teaches about believing a lie? In 2 Thessalonians 2, 9 through 12, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. You know what happens when you bite the devil's hook, line, and sinker? Regarding racism, bigotry, prejudice, discrimination, you've believed a lie. And you know what happens when you believe a lie and obey a lie? You'll burn in hell. It's that simple, friend. This did not come from God. So the creation of the misnomer, the wrong name of racism, didn't come from God. It has ultimately come from Satan. Now third, let's talk about some concerns with racism. What's the purpose of racism? I can tell you what it is. It takes away the attention from stupidity. Are you, are you aware that to stain and to soil the reputation of others in the minds of some makes them feel good about themselves? Meaning that if I can make this group of people look like a bunch of idiots, it makes me look less stupid in my mind. But really what it does is it makes me out to be the fool, doesn't it? Every time. Now, Belittling or shunning others for some reason provides a rush to absent-minded hypocrites without the knowledge of God in their hearts. I'm going to give you some biblical examples of really what it would be as bigotry, but generally we know it as racism. Turn me to the book of Jonah. The minor prophet Jonah, maybe 30 pages or so before the book of Matthew, but the minor prophet Jonah. And let's see what Jonah did. You know, in every chapter of the book of Jonah, he's running. And running ain't always a bad thing. It just depends on which direction you're running. Now understand that. Look in the book of Jonah, chapter 1 and verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came unto Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh. Nineveh was a chief city of Assyria. Assyria was a bad place filled with bad people. They were not Hebrews. They were Gentiles, as it were. Very wicked. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry against it for their wickedness. Observe this. God is concerned, number one, about these wicked people, so much so that he's sending a prophet to them. So God loves Nineveh enough to send them a prophet, doesn't he? Indeed, he does. For their wickedness has come up before me but Jonah. But Jonah rose up to flee unto Tarshish from the presence of the Lord and went down to Joppa. Understand that. He's told to go one way to this group of people. He literally goes the entire opposite direction. Now, we understand what happens. Jonah has to go out and spend a little time in the belly of a great fish. And he comes to his senses a little bit and he finally goes to Nineveh, and he finally preaches to him. Now, look at his, basically what we have recorded of his sermon in Jonah chapter 3 and verse number 4. And Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. That seems to be the summation of what he preached. I feel confident that he probably said other things, but that's basically what the Bible gives us. Now, Look down in verse number 10 of chapter 3 and watch this. And God saw their works. Whose works? The people of Nineveh, the Assyrians. God saw their works that they turned from their evil way. And God repented, that is, he, he backed off of the evil, that is, the punishment that was to come upon them, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. But look at chapter 4 and verse 1. Now, isn't that beautiful? Gospel preacher, as it were, goes in, preaches the gospel, and people change. Isn't that what you want? Oh, no. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly. Now, help me understand this. How does a prophet of God, obviously inspired, 
go in and preach God's message, people do exactly what he told them to do, and then he's mad. I see a problem there. Don't you? It's not with God. And it's obviously not with the people who obeyed God's message. It's with the messenger himself. Now, friend, we better watch out real close. That when we tell people what to do, it don't matter what color they are. When they do it, they're right. Amen. Do you understand that? Are you prepared for that? It doesn't really matter who sits in this building and who doesn't. Ooh, I'm preaching now. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly and he was very angry. Now watch. Let me prove his bigotry right here in the next verse. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord... Was not this my saying when I was yet in? There it is. What does it say? My country. Observe that. Do you observe that? That's bigotry, friend. Jonah really evidently thought in his mind, I'm going to go do what God told me to do. These people are so sorry. They're not going to do anything. I'm going to get to go back home and these people are going to die and hate. It's been a great day. But the unthinkable happened. People listened to the word of God. And they obeyed the word of God. Isn't that amazing? Even wicked people deserve the word of God, don't they? Now what happens when they're a different skin pigment than you? And what happens when they obey it? And what happens when they say, I'm ready to do the Lord's will? Uh, well, we wasn't expecting you to do that. Why do we preach anything? If it's not to save the souls of men, what are we doing? What color is the soul? What color is the spirit of a man? Who cares? Preach the gospel. Therefore I fled unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. I'm going to give you another illustration. There's an Old Testament illustration. And Jonah was probably an accurate reflection of the Jews' overall mindset when Nineveh repented. They thought they were better than everybody else. And the Ninevites proved them wrong. And God proved them wrong by sending them a prophet and say, I want these people to do right. What's wrong with you, Jonah? But I want you to turn me to our scripture reading in Acts chapter 10. Some concerns with racism. What's the purpose? It stains and soils the reputation of others. But here's the second reason. It shows supremacy, or at least apparent supremacy, for them and theirs. You won't find the word racism in the Bible, but you will find terms such as favor, favoritism, partiality, and respect of persons. We cannot be respecter of persons. We cannot demonstrate respect of persons to anyone. We cannot be partial to anyone simply because they look differently than us. Now, in Acts chapter 10... You understand what this is. This is where the gospel, the new covenant, the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, there's no doubt that Cornelius and apparently those of his household had absolutely no blood connection to the Hebrew people at all. He was not a proselyte. Those there were not proselytes. They had never converted to Judaism. Even the Samaritans perhaps had some Hebrew blood in them. But Cornelius... And those of his household, these are full-blown Gentiles. Full-blown, absolutely, no doubt about it. What gospel did they get? Was there a Jew gospel and then a Gentile gospel? Is that God trying to make more division amongst us? Or did he give the same gospel to the Jew and the same gospel to the Gentile? He gave the same gospel to both, didn't he? Now look at Acts 10, 34 and 35. Peter had to have a miraculous vision to kind of help him see this. What God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. You need to understand this. But look at what Peter says in Acts 10, 34 and 35. Then Peter opened his mouth, the truth I perceive, that God is no respecter of persons. God doesn't believe in racism. God doesn't believe in bigotry. God doesn't believe in discrimination and things of that nature, does he? But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. You know what happens. They obey the gospel. The gift of the Holy Ghost is poured out on them and they speak with tongues and magnify and glorify God. But look in chapter 11. 
Chapter 11, verses 1 through 18 is an expanded orderly account of what happens in Acts chapter 10. Now, Acts 11 and verse 1, And the apostles and brethren that were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received, that is, obeyed the word of God. Well, what word of God did they obey? The gospel, the New Testament, the New Covenant. And when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, now wouldn't you think, yay, here the Jews are. The Gentiles have obeyed the gospel, yay. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not how it went. Look, and when Peter was come up to Jerusalem, they that were of the circumcision, that's a fancy way to say the Jews, contended with him. That is, they disputed with him, saying, Thou wentest in to men uncircumcised and didst eat with them? Now, wait a minute. What does that have to do with anything? It has a lot to do with everything when you think that your ethnic group is superior to others. I got news for you. The Bible doesn't teach that. The Bible doesn't teach that any ethnic group is superior or inferior to any other. And even in Bible times, even in New Testament times, people struggled understanding that. You think people struggle understanding that today? Oh, yeah. Very, very, very badly. But now number four. Let's talk about the cure for racism quickly. The truth stops racism dead in its tracks every time. Number one, here's a cure. You need to crave improvement. Do you know where things change? It changes on an individual basis. And we as individuals, as an individual Christian... If we don't desire change individually, it'll never happen. I remember in the long ago in Psalm 51.10, David said, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Have we prayed that prayer on our behalf regarding racism and bigotry and discrimination? God, create in me a clean heart. Help me get my mind straight. Regarding this false, deplorable ism. Have we done that? You understand Acts 3.19 teaches that conversion is an individual thing. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. It's an individual thing and if you don't crave it, it'll never happen. But second, there has to be communication. You know... Somebody may call me a racist for preaching about racism, and that's all right. I've been called all kinds of things, and I'm sure I'll be called all kinds of other things if time marches on, and that's okay. But ignoring things doesn't fix them. It causes them to fester and explode. Let me give you some principles. James 1, 19 and 20. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear. Slow to speak, slow to wrath. For the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And then the positive aspect, there's the, the hearing part, but then the speaking. Ephesians 4.29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. But that which is good to the use of edifying, building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. But also consider the aspect of commonality. You realize the gospel is one size fits all. There's not a Jew gospel. There's not a Gentile gospel. There's not a gospel for this ethnic group and then something else for this ethnic group. It fits us all. The gospel is one size fits all. You understand what the Bible teaches in 2 John 9 through 11? Whosoever, whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Whoever. But, he that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God's speed. For he that biddeth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. We all have to strive for the gospel standard. There is the standard that we hit. But then consider the aspect, what's the cure for racism? You know this one. It's Christ. What's the cure? For racism. It's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one Savior of all people, of all ethnic groups for all time. Now, if that's not God's way of trying to eliminate division, I don't know what would be. God is doing His best to eliminate the divisions amongst humanity. 
How did he do it? And what's the best, greatest thing he could have ever done to bring all people together? Jesus. You can't get any better than that. And if we won't accept that, we won't accept anything. And you better be ready to burn in hell for all time. If we won't accept Jesus, there is no other option. Jesus died for the sins of all mankind. Hebrews 2.9. Not just this one or that one. All of us. He wants everyone to be reconciled in the one body. You know what that one body is? It's the one church. Ephesians 2.16. How has God done his best to eliminate bigotry and discrimination and racism? He designed the church to be the body of Christ. And we take all different people from all different walks of life. We have the same standard. We hit it and we go to heaven hand in hand. But that's for some reason awful difficult to understand. I don't know about you, but I'm glad that Jesus doesn't practice racism. Red and yellow, black and white, the blood of Jesus Christ will make you right. Don't matter what color you are. Sin is no respecter of persons and neither is our Savior. You understand that? Humanity's great differences will probably never be completely eradicated, but we can do our best to stand on the truth of God's Word and not be ashamed to talk about the tough stuff. Every person must live soberly, righteously, and godly in Christ. If you plan on going to heaven, you plan on going to heaven, then you need to be in Christ. You need to hear the truth, Acts 18, 8. You need to believe the truth, John 8, 24. You need to repent of sin, Acts 3, 19. Confess Jesus Christ to be the Son of God, Romans 10, 9 and 10. Be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Are you aware that 1 Peter 3, 21 says that baptism doth also now save us? You can't mess with that. Are you aware that Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved? You can't mess with that. But brethren, we got to walk in the light. We got to be faithful. We got to get all the worldliness out of us. Amen. Acts 14, 22. It's going to be through much tribulation that we enter into the kingdom of God. Get it right. Do it now. As together we stand as we sing the song of encouragement.